Hey, future respiratory therapists. Today, let's talk about suctioning. Everything you need to know to safely perform this procedure, well as know when you should do it and what you should be on the lookout for. Let's dive in. So the first thing you need to know when we're talking about suctioning is why would you suction somebody? So this is basically the indications. What are your indications for suctioning, okay? And I'm just gonna use three simple words to uh, help you remember your indications for suctioning. One is patency. So is your airway patent or not, okay? So uh, you always wanna make sure in suctioning the tracheal tube um, or your artificial airway, maybe it's a tracheostomy tube, to assure that your airway is patent. Okay, so patency is uh, very, very important. Number two, um, anytime you have indications of excessive secretions. So this could be coarse crackles when you listen to your, to your uh, patient's breath sounds. This could be increased frematis when you're feeling your patient's chest. This could be assessment of the flow volume loop and you see a sawtooth pattern. This could be increased peak airway pressures, decreased saturations, anything that might lead you back to going, oh, my patient has retained secretions that we need to help get them get out, okay? You would suction that patient. And then the third one here, um, I'm just going to put sample, and this is when you want to take um, a sputum sample and send it to the lab for, um, for culturing to find out what organism specifically is causing the problem in this patient. Okay, So those are really the three big indications. You want to make sure and establish patency of your airway and maintain patency of your airway. You always want to remove any retained secretions and you want to, uh, you're want to you going to have to suction somebody when you want to send a sputum specimen to the lab for studies to be done on. Okay, So once we know um, why we're going to suction them, then let's talk about the four key things that you need to remember when suctioning, okay? So primary three indications and then four elements here that you wanna remember um, to suction somebody safely, okay? The first thing here is hyperoxygenate. Okay, that's the first thing. Now we're gonna hyperoxygenate before and after the suctioning event, and we're going to do that to prevent and, and help prevent or correct any hypoxemia that might be associated with the suctioning episode. Okay, so hyperoxygenate your patients pre and post. Now, the second thing is um, suction, suction pressure. You want to make sure that you're following the safe recommended pressures uh, for your patients. Now, I'm not telling you that you're not going to go in and find a, a, a vacuum on full suction and somebody's suctioning. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is that there are guidelines associated with each patient population in terms of adult pediatric and neonate. Uh, very clearly laid out and used as safe guidelines. Now, these suction pressures are intended to, one, help prevent hypoxemia, help prevent tissue trauma, and help to prevent atelectasis associated with the suctioning event. So, you got to know these levels here, okay? I'm going to put them over here. Negative 100 to negative 150 are our adults. Our uh, pediatrics are negative, I'm sorry, this is negative 120. Our pediatrics are negative 100 to negative 120. And then our neonates are negative 80 up to negative 100. Now these changed recently over the last couple of years. Uh, they used to be negative 60 to 80, 80 to 100, and 100 to 120 for the adult size, but they've raised them slightly. So now max is 150 for an adult. 120 for a pediatric and 100 for a neonate. Remember, suction pressure will help reduce um, the amount of tissue trauma, the risk for atelectasis, and the risk for hypoxemia. Okay. Now, number three is catheter size. 
You want to be sure you're using an appropriate size catheter when you're suctioning your artificial airways. You, should, you ideally want your catheter to be less than 50% of the size of the artificial airway. To get this, there's a quick rule of thumb formula you can use to estimate this. You basically take your artificial airway size, multiply it times two, and then go down to the next even size. Okay? So, if we have an 80 times 2 equals 16, we go down to 14, and that's the appropriate suction catheter size that we would use for that 802. Now, let's say we had a 7.0 in the tracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. Let's just say it's a 70 tracheostomy tube. Doesn't matter. 70 times 2 equals 14. We should go down and ideally, in theory, use a 12 French suction catheter. So remember, multiply your airway times two, go down to the next even number, that will put you in the ballpark of the appropriate catheter size. Again, just like vacuum pressures or suction pressures, catheter size is going to help re reduce the risk of atelectasis, hypoxemia, and tissue trauma. Okay, so you want to be aware of that. All right, and then the last thing is um, suction uh, time less than 15 seconds. So you're gonna do, you're gonna suction intermittently. You're not gonna hold for 15 seconds, but the entire suction um, event should be less than 15 seconds, which doesn't sound like a whole lot of time. But if I just stop talking right now. That felt like a long time. It was really only about nine seconds, okay? So you can imagine how painful that is in person when I do this with my students. And I say, wait, you don't have to rush it. Take your time. Understand you have 15 seconds max. Feels like a short amount of time, but when you're suctioning somebody, that's a long time. So intermittent suctions for no more than 15 seconds, again, help reduce the risk of hypoxemia, tissue trauma, atelectasis, bronchospasm, increased ICP, all of those hazards that come along with suctioning uh, your patients, okay? So these are the four elements to safely suction your patients, okay? Now there's one more thing, or, or just, just two more things here I wanna talk about briefly um, when it comes to hazards, because I've already said multiple hazards. So what might negatively happen during a suctioning event? I already said it, hypoxemia, atelectasis, um, tissue trauma, bronchospasm, increased ICP. But there's one more that, we, that I want to talk about here, and I want you to be prepared if this case ever happens. So this is cardiac dysrhythmias. And the primary two, it can cause tachycardia, but they can also cause bradycardia. Now, what happens when you're suctioning a patient and you witness a bradycardic episode? Well, the answer to that TMC question is, is that you've initiated a um, vagal response. So you, you excited the vagus nerve and... Uh, that uh, comes off of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system and causes bradycardia. So you want to be prepared to recognize that. You want to stop suctioning, give 100% oxygen, and monitor your patient. Okay? And if it doesn't resolve, then we may be thinking about atropine to treat the bradycardia. But typically just stopping and hyperoxygenating, will, 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 um, the bradycardia will, will stop and reverse and go back to whatever the baseline was before then. Now the other one is PVCs. PVC stands for premature ventricular contraction. If you ever see something on an EKG that doesn't look normal, like, you know, that's, this is more normal looking, and then we get one that looks like this, this is abnormal. 
This is a PVC. This can happen in response to irritation and or hypoxemia. We are going to stop. When your TMC asks you what you would do in this case, your answer is to stop and provide 100% oxygen because this is probably happening in response to hypoxemia associated with the suctioning event. Okay? And so um, you want to be prepared for that as well. Okay? That's suctioning, guys. Remember your indications, okay? Three words. Is your airway patent? Do you have excessive secretions and all the different ways that that can manifest and say, yes, I need to suction this patient because they have excessive secretions. And then third, do I need to send a sputum sample to the lab? Once you start the process, always hyperoxygenate pre and post. Make sure your suction pressures are set accordingly, okay? Max 150 for an adult, max 120 for a pediatric, and max negative 100 for a neonate. Is your catheter size correct? ET tube, tracheostomy tube, times two, down to the next even size is the size you should be using, and then keep your intermittent suctioning episodes to a max of 15 seconds. And if you do that, you will reduce all of the hazards, hypoxemia, atelectasis, increased ICP, bronchospasm, cardiac dysrhythmias associated with suctioning. I hope you found this video very helpful. 10 minutes we covered suctioning. Leave me your comments, your questions. I'd love to hear what you thought about the video. Also hit the like button if you will and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Best wishes.